And when the nurse would leave, he'd pull everything out and put his clothes on and sneak out of the hospital and go to the bar. True. It's true. They'd call home. We lost your husband. He ain't here. I know where he is. I was in the house one day. She called the bar. Just like any other day. Hey, I need to talk to Dave. Just a minute. Davey, phone. Hello. What are you doing? I can't stand that hospital. I had to get a drink. Dry cup. You got nothing to give. If you're trying to find your identity through those significant people, no wonder we're in trouble. Yeah. You can preach the gospel to people, and you know what they say? Well, you don't know what it was like when I was growing up. We're not talking about when you were growing up. You're 35. Stop. We're not talking about that. Stop identifying and making that your story. He wants to give you new life. Yes. He wants to give you new life. He wants to call that dead. That's supposed to be dead. That's supposed to die in the likeness of his death. And give you new life, a new name, a new identity. It's not, well, now you're writing a book, your story. <laughs> you're trying to find identity through all that stuff. It's not good, unless it points people to Jesus. I'm not saying everybody that wrote a book about their story. But a lot of those books are, have a catch to it. It's weird. People are finding their identity through pain and through their story. And the, and the highest grace, they reduce themselves to the highest grace they receive, is that it seems like somebody cares. But that doesn't change anything or set them free. So they live for somebody to care. Because they felt like their whole life nobody cared. And the whole time you got the blood of Jesus speaking better things and you're not putting your eyes in the right place. Yeah. And you're trying to get it this way. Yeah. Oh, I'm preaching clear to you today. Yes. Yes. I'm glad you let me come. It feels good. <laughs> it does. I feel life. It just, this is the way I think when I wake up. This is the stuff I see in my life. So come hell or high water, nothing changes about truth. Lord. That's why 22 years in, I'm passionate. I'm not like, well, brothers, you know, life is challenging. You just got to trust God. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell I'm passionate? Yeah. I try to calm down to preach. I seriously try to communicate. I'm way more excited on the inside. This is, this is me suppressed. <laughs> It's just telling me. Because I need to communicate. <laughs> Why? Because I don't talk about him. I've lived with him. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not talking, but there's a difference between knowing about him and knowing him. Yeah. Eternal life is knowing him, not praying a prayer to go to heaven. The expression of eternal life. I'm not talking about you saying you're not going to heaven. What I'm saying is, the people panic over that stuff. Because their whole goal is making heaven. Heaven's in you. Yes, yes. You're one with yes. the eternal one. Yeah. Yeah. Stop living for that day when today's right in front of you. Now, you still are living for that day in the sense of your legacy and your heritage. But what I'm saying is stop like, well, I hope I'm saved. Yeah. And you run to the altar every once in a while to try to make peace. That's a warning signal that you're way out of bounds. <laughs> Oh, they have a call for the backslidden tonight. It's been a while. <laughs> Come on, we get so religious, we don't even know what we're doing. <laughs> oh, God. I'm having a hard time recovering. <laughs> the reason I'm passionate is because I'm preaching us. When I, when I started reading my Bible in the beginning, the Lord, he said, Dan, I don't ever want you to read your Bible. He said, I'm going to put revelations of my love and righteousness in you. You're going to speak to many of my people. I'm like, and I knew it was the Lord. I'm like, why? Because I'm not a speaker. I don't have an education. I'm not. Ah. And he's like, but listen, when that day's coming, I don't want you to read your Bible ever. Ever read your Bible and preach a sermon. He said, I only ever want you to read your Bible to know me. And only ever speak out of who I am in your life. And that will carry weight. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Yes. Amen. Amen. You could stand and talk about God all day and stir people's knowledge in any way. And I tell you, I can feel it when I preach. What I'm saying pierces heart too. It's not my fault. It's it's the anointing. You'd see that I'm speaking out of revelation. I'm speaking out of us. I read my Bible to know him. And, and knowing him is eternal life. So when I'm speaking out and knowing him, it gets into, it pierces. It's, even people that don't want to hear 
get frozen a yeah. lot. Yeah. Yeah. I was just in a rehab place for guys. They're, 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 they're mandatorily there, some of them. Some of them are court ordered there. They're not there because they want to be. They're there because they have to be. And I'm in there preaching, and they're, they're making sure that I know they don't want to hear what I have to say. <laughs> Doing that stuff. Young kids leaning back in the chair, looking at each other, rolling their eyes while I'm preaching my best. But all of a sudden, 10, 15, 20 minutes, right. the posture changes a little. Yeah. Next thing you know, they're looking at me. Next thing you know, they're leaning in the head now. Next thing you know, I'm baptizing them. <laughs> the worst student they said they've ever had in history. They had marked him as the worst student ever. Unmanageable. Going to have to get him out of the program. Unmanageable. Stood on the edge of the pond and cried. Said, I learned so much tonight. I didn't even want to hear this man. I didn't even want to hear what he had to say. But the words he said were right inside me. I couldn't do nothing about it, and I realized I've been so deceived. Yeah. I'm letting everything around me control me, and I think I'm in control. Yeah. And I'm done being deceived. I want to die so I can live. You get a guy talking like that, you put him under, every bubble stops. You wait. You take him serious and trust God will raise him up. <laughs> like that, you trust God. Because <laughs> isn't Christianity all about dying? If you don't die, you'll never live. How many of us have got tricked into just bringing him into our life? Incorporating him into our life. Yeah. Jesus incorporated. <laughs> you don't put new wine in old wine skin. You can't think the same after you're a Christian. You can't let old mindsets be your truth. New wine won't stay in old wine skin. Both become now. You become a new creature. You get renewed in the spirit of your mind. You get transformed by the renewing of your mind. You start thinking like you've... The word renewed, by the, uh, renewed in your mind, it means thinking like you've never thought before. He says, those of you that think you're wise in this age, you need to assume to know, <coughs> determine to know nothing so you can become wise. Yeah. You see what we're called to? Now you be honest with me. What have I preached this morning, even last night, that you personally can't live by faith apart from any other factor of going in your life right now? You be honest. What have I preached that you can't pursue and be established in and live by faith apart from any other situation or factor or person in your life? You don't need one thing around you to change you to step into what I'm talking about. That's how you know it's the gospel and it's the truth. Because yes. it puts everything on him and you. Yeah. And you can't say, well, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what it's like being married to my spouse. But you don't know what it's like when my kids are dying. You're crazy. <laughs> no, you're letting them. That's right. Because you have higher expectations than they're fulfilling. And now you're living with a hurt or a hard or an unforgiving heart. Yeah. And you've allowed life to decide the condition of your heart instead of the one that gives life. You're finding yourself through things instead of Him. And all of a sudden, you're only doing as good as it's going instead of as good as He is in you. Yes. Come on, that's just good, straight up, solid talk right now. <laughs> We're all called to this. Everybody in here is called to this. I'm proud of you, by the way. You actually showed up at 9.30. <laughs> I was an unbeliever. <laughs> Cowboy church for one thing they do Thursday night. They don't even do weekends. And I'm like, who's gonna come Friday night? And then I keep them there and then we come back Saturday at 9 30. Then they ain't come. I said, are they coming? He said, no, they're coming. Shouting <laughs> Dan. I pulled up. I said, Lord, I'll repent. <laughs> they're here. I'm 
glad you're here. It speaks to your hunger, your desire. It's, un it's, it's humbling and honoring that you came this morning. And I think God met us with passion as soon as I stepped up there. I tried to talk about this little fella. You guard your own heart, not somebody else's. You guard your own heart. For out of your heart flows the issues of life. You make sure you stay good where you and God are concerned. So you get a good view of everybody around you. You guard your own heart. Don't get busy about somebody else's. Make sure yours is seeing clear. Now don't look at the log in your brother's eye. Put a speck in your other's, brother's eye and then you find you have a log in your own eye. You first take that log out of your eye. So you can clearly rightly discern the speck in your brother. Come on, this is stuff Jesus taught. For a whole chapter he said, you say what I say. You say what I said. Six times. You say what I What's he saying? You ain't saying what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Which means we haven't been taught by truth. Yeah. Come on. You have heard it said. And a lot of those references are the way it is under the law. But he came to bring a new and living way. It's a new covenant through his blood. But he says stuff like, watch what he says. He says stuff like, you say, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say unto you. Yeah. That's strong language. The way, the truth, and life. The one we worship and adore. He says, but I say to you. The king of glory. The one that was and is and is to come. The son of the living God. Name above every name. He said, but I say to you. That ought to matter. <laughs> That's right. You say, love your enemy, or love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemy. Love my enemy. They ain't done nothing for me. You better than they were here. Now I say, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you and give to those who would spitefully use you. Well, why would I do that? So that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he causes it to rain and the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. What credit is it to you if you only ever love those who are busy loving you? Even the tax collectors and pagans to us. Ain't that something? So sonship isn't a confession. It's an expression. Blessed are the Peacemakers, for they are the sons of God. Sonship is an expression, not a confession. You see, sonship through a man's life, a man's speech. So you recognize that every man has value. Or he will shed his blood. No matter what he sees or what he's living, he's more than what he understands. So forgive him, Father. They know not what they do. It should be a big deal. Oh, I think they know what they're doing. I think they do it just to stir around butts. In fact, they just know how to get a rise. I mean, you keep telling me they ain't doing that on purpose. Some people just don't want to change. I think they're being willful. And all of a sudden, this analytical language just keeps keeping your heart in bondage. And the whole time, you think they're the one that has a problem. <laughs> Ain't that something I can say that with a smile and you don't get mad? You don't get mad at me for something. I had a man not pastor whose wife just got on the internet and got to see. They had some unreckoned, unresolved conflict. You know, that, that, that Hollywood flicker when they got married, that little flame. Just wasn't that way anymore. Two young kids, life, everyday jobs, loads of laundry, cooking meals, life. And after a while, they got some unresolved stuff, and they go to bed at night without resolve. And after a while, you don't even think you like each other anymore, let alone love each other. And you say you fell out of love. So she's on the internet because she's not getting some things she needs from him. And she's got certain beliefs and doesn't even want certain things from him. She's on the internet, and she's sure she fell in love. The total, total, utter deception. You coming to preach? <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, this guy got a word. 
So she gets on the internet and says, let me just share some stark with you. It's total and utter deception to think that you can fall in love and out of love. It's a needs-driven, insecure thing. It's, it's totally emotionally driven. That's why it feels so powerful and real in the moment. Because you're fueling your needs. It's a fantasy. It's a dead-end street. It's a life now. You, you, you can't you can get on the internet and chat with somebody and be vulnerable and have unresolved conflicts and start and be sure you're in love and be so drawn. I just love him so much. No, you are so snared. It's ridiculous. You are super vulnerable. You are super needy. And you have lost sight of truth. And you're, and you're living in a whirlwind of it's a Hollywood movie. Yeah. It's zero, an absolute lie. It's impossible because love takes no account of the wrong done to it. Love doesn't seek its own. And the whole reason you're so moved, it's because of what you're getting out of it. Not what you're giving. Yeah. The thing we call love is almost always need. I love you. Do you love me? And what you're saying is I love you for me. I love you for what you do for me, what you give me, what you make me. So don't ever pull out on me. My world will be over. And we think that's flattering. I couldn't live without you. You make it happen for me. You know, if I'd ever lose you, I don't know what. There's only one that deserves that ever. Amen. And his name is Jesus. And he, that's right. And he, he fits that. He's our all in all. But true love, he never says that. That's controlling. It's manipulative. It's, it's binding someone to you for your sake. Because as soon as they get outside of that need, you fly off the handle and fall apart like a wild animal in a corner. Why? Because you ain't getting what you need. Yeah. And that's how two people can say they love each other and be intimate and have children and all of a sudden hate one another. Because it wasn't never love. It's just all right to talk about this stuff. So she gets on the internet and he's saying all the things she needs to hear. So he just, she's hook, line, and sinker. She's, she, she just hands divorce papers and takes off and goes to be with this man in another state who she's never met face to face. She's going, but her goal is to go be with him, sleep with him. And he's going, meet her needs. And she's going, feel like a woman. It's all a lie. He comes running into me crying, telling me the story. He's got divorce papers, he didn't see it coming. We're talking, you know, I'm trying to help him and keep him in a good place. And he takes off. I meet with her, and she looks at me, cold, blank stare. I've been good my whole life. It's time for me to have some fun. I said, fun. And I cried, and I told her what she's doing and how deceit this is. Well, I'm doing it. Oh, I cried. You have no idea I cried. So she did it. Five days, he's in the bedroom. He can't even function. He takes his kids over to grandparents. He's just in his bedroom, pacing, screaming, hitting the walls, freaking out. God, you've got to bring her back. God, how could you let this happen? God, what's going on? God, just freaking out. Five days. Can't even function. Five days, the Lord lets five days go by, and he slides into that door and back. He says, would you stop praying that? You don't have a problem. Analytical. What do you mean I don't have a problem? <laughs> Was this a joke to you? I don't have a problem. I got divorce papers in my hands. My kids no longer have a mother. My wife is in the arms of another man. And I ain't got no problem. Said he screamed it with hate like he ain't never felt towards no one. And the Lord calmly said, what I said, you ain't got no problem. Your wife is in trouble. And how is it I can live inside? This is the impression he got after that. He heard, that's what he heard. He sat down and lost it, cried. This is how God ministered. How is it that all these five days I can live in you? And all you can do is cry for yourself. And you ain't never one time thought about the state of her soul mm. and the condition she's in. All you can do is yell, cry out. And think for yourself, you have not shed one tear. Now that's the Lord. You can hardly share that testimony in church, and get, no matter what city I go to, and get people to really comprehend that. 
because we'd all be that man. This is all right. But God said, how is it possible I live in you? And all you can do is cry for yourself. When you supposedly deny yourself and don't love your own life under death, so you'd be a shining light to everyone around you. Even your Because you were in flesh and blood anyway, is it? It wrecked the guy. He come running into my office crying, and I see him crying, and I'm thinking, well, here we go. I go, I have to pastor this guy. And I gotta be gentle, but I gotta be truthful. I gotta understand, but I can't. I'll cry with you for 20 seconds. If you get 20 seconds of tears, there'll be 20 sincere seconds. But you probably won't make it to 30 seconds. I ain't kidding. I'll, cry, I'll hold you and cry and wish they didn't make that choice and leave you. But after about 20 seconds of holding you crying, I got to quit crying with you because I'm going to allow you to stay there for a while. And I need to look at you and say, now listen, you need to understand something right quick. The decision they made has nothing to do with who you are right now. And you are no less anointed, no less called, no less a son, a daughter. You're no less accepted in the beloved. And how you respond is incredibly important to how you respond to what they've done. And you can't let what they've done decide who you are for a moment. That's how straight I pastor. That's how strong I am. Because I live that life. And it's powerful. And I don't move around life. And I don't lose days. And I don't find myself sopping for a week. I don't have any knowledge of that in my life for 22 years. Redeem the time. The days are evil. Don't get swallowed up by evil. Redeem the time. Don't lose a day in feelings. Don't lose a day in human wisdom. And the whole time you can shine brighter. And the whole time you can make a statement that will speak forever and mark the hearts of men. He came into my office crying. I thought, oh, here we go. I had no discernment on it, man. I thought this is tough. So I'm like, Lord, I'm just doing what I do to prepare. So I touch him right. And I said, just went like this. He come right in the office. And he said, don't worry. He's sharp. He said, don't worry. My tears aren't probably what you think. I have heard from the Lord. And I said, what do you say? <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> and he went on to tell me that story. And I left and said, That was you heard the Lord. The Lord is so bold and amazing. His love is so powerful. He strolls in a bedroom when a man is screaming and freaking out. And looks like he's antagonizing him a little more. Like the Lord is so solid. Like when, when he's screaming back at the Lord, the Lord's not like Excuse me. <laughs> He's just sitting there waiting for him to be done. You talk about analytical. What do you mean I don't have a problem? And he laid the whole list out that he would tell all his friends. That his friends would buy into. But the Lord ain't buying. My wife, when she walked out on the Lord, when we were getting divorced and she walked away from the Lord, because she was the Christian, I wasn't. And she's praying for 13 years for me to be saved. For 13 years, she's crying out to God, and I'm getting worse. <laughs> so when she decided this marriage ain't working and I'm moving on, I got right in her face and celebrated and threw it right back at her and said, well, I'm glad you finally came to this decision. I've been waiting for this for a long time. <laughs> I'm just glad we both agreed that it's time to move on, and I'm going to start my life anew. I'm going to get a new, fresh face in my life. I, th I was so mean. I said, I don't know why I wasted 13 years with you anyway. Two children together. Told her I loved her. And now I'm just bam because it ain't working. We're trying to be mean to yet. It's amazing what we do to each other. <clears throat> she went in a bedroom that day. She told me, she said, she's just pacing. After I slammed her back, she carved her heart. She said, I ain't crying. I ain't being hurt through this. She shut herself down. You know what people do? Cold. And then she looked up at the ceiling and she said, and you? I'm done with you, too. I prayed to you for 13 years. 13 years, and you've done nothing. You've allowed me and these children to suffer through hell, and you've done nothing. I'm sure he's worse. I don't need you. That's what she said to the Lord. She just walked off out of the room. 
See that how that analytical will get you? Well, ain't it something? Five months later, Jesus comes to my workplace and saves me. Like, saves me. <laughs> my wife was at home with a girl ten years younger, smoking a joint. My wife was kind of sadly delighted. <laughs> smoking a joint, a marijuana. And drink a little mixture. It'd just be like my husband. He'd come around someday and say, I found the Lord. <laughs> her, little, her little counselor buddy who was 10 years younger than her I was jealous of her I wasn't saved so I'm just being real I'm just being a, a guy that's not saved right now she, I called her a biker chat because <laughs> the Harleys would pull in there on the weekend sometime more than one and they would never leave till morning she'd do her garden and her weeds and her flower beds with a little string bikini on and she'd always face her behind towards the road to pull her weeds. And I, was, and, I, and I was jealous of her. I was mad I didn't have a heart. And I was probably mad I was mad. I'm just being real. And I used to, I used to demean her and trash talk her because I was envious of whoever was hanging out with her because to me she was hot looking. So I would down talk her and try to get close to my wife like, I thought she was just some biker chick, some sleazy, some, and I'd act like I was demeaning her, and the whole time in my heart, I was wishing I had a heart on <laughs> I'm just being relatable and real. That was when I didn't know Jesus. Ain't that something how we are, living in cover-up and stuff? So that was her counselor, little counselor friend, 10 years younger. They met just going back and forth to the park with the kids, you know, talking, and now she's, she's saying, well, don't you ever go back to him if he tries to pull back? These men, they're all the same. They don't realize how good they had until they see that they're losing. And then they come crawling back. Don't you yield him. Don't you. You go and live your life. You got a life to live. You're done with him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fifteen minutes after that conversation, I call her crying and overwhelmed and say, I don't know why I'm calling you, but God is real. <laughs> and she just hung up on me. Click. <laughs> but it didn't change God being real. I didn't go to God to save my marriage. I was thinking my marriage is over and I was celebrating it. My wife's three years and nine months older than me. So when I was 19 and she was 23, that was cool. When I was 20 and got married, she was 24. I thought, I am marrying a woman. This ain't no girl I graduated with. This is a woman. Right? So now I'm 33 and she's 37. And that's not a problem. It's not a problem today, right? But back then, I'm 33, she's 37. And this girl that's 25 likes me for some reason. And I'm thinking, I'm going to make it work with her because she likes guys older than her. And she's a friend of my, she's a sister of my good friend growing up. And she always had this childhood crush on me. So I bumped into her at a convenience store. And she just looked at me. And, you know, you can tell she still felt that way. And we talked. And I thought, ooh, I'm going to pull this off and make this happen. I'm going to, I'm going to go back eight years and go to 25. And I'm starting over. And, and I'm writing the plans of starting over and I go to work and Jesus came and messed it all up. <laughs> he was right on time. Because I was going to make a big mistake and just buy time that I didn't have. And just fuel and feed my flesh. And Jesus came and intervened. I still am humbled by that because I was going to make some manly mistake. This flesh mistake. But God, in the midst of all that, came and rescued me. So now my wife's furious. I'm the last person that has a voice in her life. And she's mad, even more mad at God now, because she's like, if this is true, why did you wait 13 years and save him now after it's too late and I've already made these choices to move forward in my life? And why are you playing games, God? And she just don't understand. She's just mad. So for seven weeks, she went out of her way to hurt me, break my heart, and get a rise out of me. For seven weeks. So she could go, aha, and use my weakness to justify her life. See how we do? And in all that process, we prove we really don't know Him. We've just sang songs about Him. When we're living that way, we prove we don't know Him like we say. You just give your spouse the silent treatment. It happens all the time in marriages. You just body language. Just send your message. <laughs> hey, baby, you doing okay? Honey? This is roping them in, right? Every time you do that, you just reveal without realizing it, 
You don't know him like the same, because he would never do that. It's control, it's manipulation, it's self-centered. Yeah. Ain't that something? Don't elbow your spouse or I'm talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> if you elbow your spouse, it's a giveaway. I was talking to you. <laughs> See? <laughs> Seven weeks my wife fought this thing, right? <laughs> Ha ha ha!